Donc aujourd'hui, je vais parler tout seul parce que M. Grenet est un peu enroumé, il m'a de gauche, donc je parle seul. <laughs> Excusez-moi, nous. Donc, euh, <coughs> so, je parle en anglais. Et, uh, and let's start. Last time we finished our introduction to an important document on the invoice of Kangju and Su Xie from the Xuanquan ruins in the northwest of China. And this document is dated in 39 BCE, but very likely the Han court had known about Kangju almost 100 years ago. Concerning the years once, uh, 134 BCE and 130 BCE, here I follow the revised edition of Yu Tai Shan's Sai Zhong Shi Cong Kao, a study of Saka history published in Peking in 2012. It was updated from the first edition in 1992, which was then translated into English and published in America. Recently, my Peking colleagues informed me that actually the English version of the revised Chinese version was also published just at the end of last year. But unfortunately, due to the COVID situation and the disturbed business of China Post, I have not received this book. Anyway, as I will try to explain, this work can be said as the best and most comprehensible ones right now among Chinese publications concerning the history of Kangju and its neighbors. And personally, I appreciate his effort much because he insists to publish his important works in traditional Chinese characters without creating his own translation or transposition for some names difficult to Chinese. And I say so because I am expected more and more often to translate um, ancient Kuchian or Gandar uh, Gandari names into Mandarin by spelling it in a modern way when writing a paper right now for Chinese readers. Nevertheless, one has to be careful when reading and using Yu Tai Shan's work. In one phrase, with regarding to some important historical issues, his words almost like a modern patchwork like Tong Dian. So, before one uses it, it is often necessary to trace the origin of his statements and the underlying reason of his judgment. So I will do it side by side with an introduction to the historical background until the establishment of the Protectorate of Western Regions, or Xiyu, in the Taring Basin. In brief, in addition to a firm sinological training in Beijing, Yu Taishan is uh, largely based on his understanding of early scholars, especially Japanese and German, such as Shilatoli in Tokyo and Kuwabara in Kyoto and Makwat in Berlin. However, old German works are too complicated, of course, even to me and to many modern Westerners. So I think it's safe to say that Yu's understanding of German works is largely based on Shilatoli's uh, and Kuwabara's digest of Iran Shah and other works by Marquardt, etc., in their Japanese works. For instance, so far we have talked about the five petty kings subject to Kangju for several times, and on these issues, Yu's opinion is against Shilatoli because he chose to believe Xin Tang Shu in one phrase. But such a situation happens quite rarely since Shilatoli's writing can be said as the skeleton of Yu's point of view on many key topics. So, if the early pioneers such as Xu Song in Qing Dynasty of China can be called as the stage zero concerning the development of history of Kangju and other peoples, then Shilatoli can be no doubt perceived as the most important scholar at its stage one in the early 20th century. Personally, I like to say that uh, I like to read Shilatoli's paper and books very much, but I don't like his family and his background. He and some member of his family were very knowledgeable in German to the extent that one of them even became a diplomat and involved with the ally among Germany, Italy, and Japan in World War II. 
However, I think our seminar here is a purely academic view don't, uh, concerning ancient history rather than contemporary history. So I will only explain the academical issues. First of all, it is noteworthy that in Shiratoli's view, the Chinese name in ancient Fiyagana should pronounce in Mandarin as Da Wan rather than Da Yuan. At last time, I mentioned that Bichurin gives it as Da Wan as well. So, the English title of, Chi uh, of Shiratoli 1916 is most probably a typo or a compromise with some Western scholarship in his days. In fact, what I was uh, taught since my childhood is also Da Wan, and like Rouzi rather than the Yuezhi, etc. So I usually felt an, up, an, an accustomed to some Western translations because of this or that etymological ground. And I don't think Shiratoli created the pronunciation by his own, because he and as many Japanese scholars in his days stayed in China for a long period. Uh, well, not he, but well, some of his colleagues and uh, his uh, Kam Kamahat stayed in China for a long period before becoming professor in Japan. So among these papers, and these are only a small part of Shiratoli's publications, the one being most influential to Sogdian study is no doubt 1924, uh, the Sokotok uh, Sokotokoko, <laughs> very difficult to uh, pronounce it in Japanese and it was translated into English four years later. In this paper, he rejects huge identification of Su Yi with Sugdak around the Black Sea, but with Sogdiana, <coughs> together with many other useful points and inspiring ideas. But this paper also shows a tendency in his later work, that is to say, to identify ancient peoples in northwestern China <coughs> and in Central Asia as proto-Turkic as much as possible. This more or less reflects the pan ism or pan ism in Japan during its expansion to Russia and China in order to find a cultural root of ancient Japanese uh, back to Eurasia. So it is parallel to the phenomena in his days that many Western scholars <coughs> try to find Indo-European or most, more exactly indo germanish elements in Central Asia during the big game. So in that epic era, I would say Pelio and Shratoli are the founders of Sogdian studies in the West and East respectively because Pelio did a lot with his students on the decipherment of Sogdian languages, as well as the existence of Sogdian settlement in medieval China. On the other hand, Shiratoli re-established the history of Sogdiana from Chinese sources. They achieved the same conclusion from time to time, so I think most probably independently during the war time. For example, Last year and also last session, I think, uh, we indicated Pelio's paper about ancient Chinese transcription of Huan Tian in 1938 and in the Journal of Tongbao. But Shiratoli had indicated the possibility 10 years before. So he wrote, um, it was probably even now in the Han period too that, yes, um, for the Da Wan Zhuan or biography of Da Yuan or Da Wan of the Shi Ji mentioned Huan Qian, which we may assume to be a contracted transcription of Huarism. No less were Huan, uh, Huo Xun and Huo Li in the Tang period. So, in one phrase, Shiratoli's sense of Chinese classics is extraordinarily e excellent. But when he tried to use Western etymological methods to solve some non-Chinese terms, he is not usually correct and has some bias, like most scholars in that period of imperialism and colonism. Uh, colonialism. So I think it is convincing that 
country is to be distinguished from Sogdiana, as argued in the chapter one of his long paper, but he concluded by conjecturing their difference as linguistical and ethnic ones, so that country is Altaic or even Turkic, while Sogdiana is Iranian land. This view is obviously to be justified by philological and archaeological data nowadays. And I think Yu Taishan has always tried to avoid this kind of bias. He seldom used Altaic or Indo-European skills or reference in his work, but dire uh, directly refers himself back to Greek or Latin such as Herodotus. But in mainland China, just after the Cultural Revolution, what uh, could be provided in the university education was very poor. So Yu and his contemporary had no choice but to uh, try to do their best to link Chinese and Western classics all together, usually in an intuitive manner. So I won't blame such a shortcomings, and it is not the fault of any individuals, but a common burden of his younger days. Now let's read Yu Taishan's represent, uh, works, representative works closer and in a more strict way. So, Kang Ju Zai Da Wan Xi Bei Ke Er Qian Li, Xing Guo. And you, sorry, I, I cannot <laughs> read this English text very well. I just read. Uh, Kang Ju is at a distance about 2000 Li northwest of Da Yuan. It is a land of nomad and followed very much the same way of life at the Yue Zhi. They have 80 or 90,000 trained bowmen. The state is continuous, uh, conterminous with Da Yuan and is small. In the south, the inhabitants were constrained to serve the Yue Zhi in the east, and in the east to serve the Xiongnu. <laughs> a few years ago, when I compiled the Chinese sources about Kedarite and Heptalite uh, for a group of scholars in the British Museum, Imer Galambos reminded me that one should always ask the before the name if it is to be perceived as a people, no matter it means a nomadic people or not. On the other hand, if the name, for example, Kangju, refers to a state, a region, a piece of land, etc., then it is not necessary to give the. So first of all, we can ask ourselves if the is to be put here as the kanji or not. And even if this question purely concerning English grammar is not so essential, a crucial problem immediately arrives, namely how to translate ke er qian li here highlighted in blue with at a distance of about 2000 li. On this expression, you choose a translation quite different from earlier ones. For example, Shilatoli gives situated about 2000 Li, and this is the one adopted by Eric Zürcher in his paper for the, uh, a conference on the dating of Kanishka, a very famous paper. And then for Watson's translation of Shiji, English translation, mm -hmm. He translated it as situated some 2000 Li, and Francois Thierry translated as situé à environ 2000 Li. And uh, as we have mentioned briefly before, one Li in the Han period is uh, about uh, 400 meters, and any rate, at any rate less than 500 meters. So, for some of you being not so familiar with classical Chinese here in this room, it could be helpful if I just translate straightforwardly um, and literally as can be said as far as 2000 Li. And this is a very vague expression. For you, I collect four examples in the same work. The first here, 左贤王为李将军,足可四千人. It means the Zuo Xian Wang, or literally wise king to the left of the Xiongnu people in the north of China, besieged the general Li, Li Guang. His soldier could be said as many as 4,000. 
And the second example is Duo Qi Jun Ke Si Qian Yu Ren. And I translate it uh, tentatively as the founder of Han Dynasty took over the troop of his enemy, and they could be said as many as more than 4,000. So here, more than corresponded with this character, Yu, more than or over. And the third example, Xiang Yu, Zhi Zu Ke Shi Wan. So the soldiers led by Xiang Yu, namely the most important rival of the founder of the Han Dynasty, could be said as many as uh, 100,000. So in the first example, uh, it is also a vague expression, and I would say that the actual number could be very close to 4,000, let's say 3,800 or 3,900, but to say uh, 4,200 could be too much. And for the second example, it is almost for sure that the actual number is more than the round number of 4,000. But for the third example, this could be rather exaggerating in order to emphasize the greatness of the founder of the Han Dynasty. And the actual number could be only, for example, um, 80 or 90,000 or even less. Okay. And I have the fourth example for you. It is a passage from the same work concerning the astronomical fact uh, or records in the same book. And in this phrase, uh, it says, uh, comet or shooting star in this year, its length can be set as long as four down. And after a while, its length can be set as long as five or six down. In this phrase, chang ke wu liu zhang, or its length can be set as long as five or six zhang, could mean that the length is variable and not determined. So, in brief, here I would rather translate this que in French as environ or presque or à peu près. So, according to the context of every pa uh, passage, each passage. In this way, uh, let's take a glimpse on Zhang Qian's first mission from the Shiji who arrived back to Bactria around uh, 129 BCE. In fact, from a healthy discussion in Japan since Shilatoli and his contemporaries, it is widely accepted that the whole passage I just read for you is most probably from Zhang Qian's original report to the Han court. And these pioneers are, I already said, uh, Shilatoli, and Kuwabara, and Fujita. All of them were originally educated in the Japanese Imperial University of Tokyo. But Shiratori went to Europe several times, so he is more famous in the West. And the other two went to mainland China and had close relations with traditional Chinese scholars. It is Kuwabara who gives the safe dating of Zhang Qian's departure from China and return and the date returned back to China in a lecture date in uh, 1910. On the other hand, Fujita was once dispatched to Taipei in order to operate the School of Humanities and Social Sciences of the Japanese Imperial Taipei University there, but he became ill soon and died in the next year. So, based on Zhang Qian's report, analyzable from the Shiji, the relative uh, distance and orientations among the remote countries can be shown in these brief diagrams. For the state of Da Yuan or Da Wan, or Fregana that we usually set, its political center is at any rate around today's Fregana Valley. And there are four states or peoples nearby it, namely the Wu Sun and Kangju the Da Yue Zhi or Great Yue Zhi and Da Xia. And Da Xia is situated at Bactria or let's say around today's northern Afghanistan. While Anxi or Arsak, namely Partia, and Yancai here, most likely Arzi, were situated very remotely. So 
Anyone who wants to discuss the location of Kang Ju in Zhang Qian's report must discuss Da Yuan or Da Wan at the same time. And concerning their distance, actually, in 1915 to 1916, a hot debate arises between these three, and I would say that this result the split of Kyoto School from Tokyo School for nearly one century. It is in 1916 that by published the Dai En Kokoko, this paper, or study of Da Wan, already said, that should totally change his view on the location of Da Wan's capital city, the Guishan city, from Kojan to Kasan. On the other hand, Kuwabala thought Kojan is still a good candidate and published a paper, Tai En Kok no ki, uh, Kizan Jo Nizi De, this one just a little bit before for it, and the paper of his lecture was uh, formally published next year. And I would uh, tentatively translate his title as uh, On the Guishan City of the State of Da Wan, and the other is Zhang Qian's mission. So then Fujita immediately published a paper and I just uh, tentatively give the English title as the Guishan city of the state of Da Wan and the Odu of the Yuezhi. And in this paper, Fujita strongly defended Shilatoli's new idea. Okay. In other words, in this period, these three scholars do not only pay attention to Zhang Qian's missions, but also to Han China's conquest to Fiagana, as stated in the Shiji and Han Shu. However, it is not easy to find a good map that includes all the toponyms in their discussions. But one can at least find both Kojan and Kasan on this map by Marquardt in 1938, Weihold und Anhang. So this is this book, the Weho und Anhang, very famous, and it is a research on the uh, myths and history of the local peoples around the East Iran. Uh, okay, so the difference of the Kyoto and Tokyo schools can be demonstrated as follows. Uh, yes. Here it is uh, what Shilatoli would like to identify as Guishan City near Kasan, uh, a small town near Nabagans. And on the other hand, this is the Kuwabara's uh, theory, who still think Kojan is a good candidate, although he did not uh, determine any final solutions. <coughs> and on this series, divergence, Yu aligned himself with Kuwabala. Unfortunately, there is no map at all in Yu Taishan's works, and this is a great pity, and it has caused so much inconvenience to his reader. In other words, Yu's scope is to be traced back to the old map in his younger days, and it is based on those maps that Yu Taishan tried to make a compromise between the two Japanese views. So, in Yu Taishan's Sai Zhong Shi Cong Kao, or a study of Saka history, it says, in the Han Shu chapter 96, on the biography of Western regions, it is recorded, the seat of the royal government of Da Yuan is at the town of Guishan. It is 1510 li north to the town of Beitian in Kangju. Since Guishan was situated at Kojan, Actually, he refers the chapter four of his own book and namely Kuwabara theory in 1910s. The town of Beitian must have been situated to the south of the Karatau and north of the Sirdaria around Turkestan. So for this footnote, actually he refers to Shilatoli and another Shilatoli. These are a republished edition of the earlier papers that I already presented, okay. So, uh, 
Last time, I think we have uh, demonstrated that, actually Fonts has demonstrated that um, nowadays our, uh, archaeologists are talking about the main uh, campus or main area of country people's activities around the south of Karatov cities here. And by using the map of Podushkin, and this uh, result is actually very close already to Shilatoli's conjectures. Now, let's read this commentary on the entry of, on Kangju in Shiji again. Just only note uh, 15 8, about 2,000 li, and distance 4. The approximate distance between the seat of the king's government of Dayuan and that of Kangju. This is what means about 2,000 li. And it means roughly the distance from Fergana to Turkestan, north of the Sirdarya. Actually, as a philologist and historian, I was not educated in mainland China, but in Paris. So I don't think I'm qualified enough to explain Yu Taishan's theory on his behalf. But as far as I can see, concerning geographical distance measured in Li, Yu Taishan affirmed the theories of Matsuda and Nagasawa of the Waseda University in Tokyo. Such an opinion is expressed in a footnote in one of his bestsellers saying concerning the Li measurement and itinerary network of the sealed work in the Han Dynasty, all the works are unreliable except for the ones written by Matsuda. This one, the English title is The Geohistorical Studies on the Ancient Tianshan Region. It is a book first published in 1956 and then revised in 70. And the second author uh, Yu Taishan trusts very much is Nagasawa, a specialist paper and only the title is on the description of the distance as revealed in the biographies of Xi Yu Zhuan, uh, Xi Yu, or in Chinese Xi Yu Zhuan, of the history of the former Han Dynasty. So, in Yu's view, all other works are only occasionally correct by chance and to be treated case by case. Now, you know that Yu's calculation of the distance is based on Mazda and Nagasawa, and Yu Taishan further improved their theory a bit. In fact, as I said, they are from the same university, a very prestigious but private one in Tokyo. And the scholars being able to get tenure in University of Tokyo are also active, including Anoki, a great scholar in the studies on Akita Wright and Aftalite, and his disciples, Morris, and others. On the other hand, Kyoto University also trained many scholars, including Uchida Gimpu, who contribute a lot on the reconstruction of the Wei Shu, and Odani Nakao, he wrote on the Great Yue Zhi a lot. There are, of course, also many other Japanese scholars in the same field, but today I only enumerate those frequently mentioned in Yu Taishan's works because their main research interests until 1990s overlapped each other, while the names in blue focus more on the 7th century and later. Unfortunately, perhaps due to reading ability or to an atmosphere after the World War II, Japanese works are generally undervalued in the West. For example, in the most representative English translation of biography of Zhang Qian, the general Li Guangli, who conquered Fergana, and the general statement about Western countries in the Han Shu, so this book, China in Central Asia, the early stage. Um, yes, we already offered a refer to this translation during our seminar many times. This book, obviously over, uh, oversimplified and in some case even misunderstood the achievement by Japanese scholarship. For instance, the influential introduction to this book saying, uh, in the notes we refer to several geographical atlases, 
but the reader will hardly find a reference to the Japanese historical atlas for Asia by Masuda and Mori, Aji Alexi Tizu, because the relevant maps are practically identical with those in Albert Hellman's useful works, being moreover drawn on so reduced a scale as to render them useless for a question of detail. Well, even though Helsve mentions Matsuda in a few footnotes of this book, it seems he only understood Japanese work to a limited extent. But it is exactly in the same year, in 1979, that Nagasawa proposed the whole diagram, <coughs> the whole diagram of the Li itinerary based on the data preserved in the Han Shu, or Book of the Han. Here I color it and give some basic toponyms for your convenience. In this diagram, the northern uh, part had been treated in Mazda's book in 1956. So, in this respect, Yu's commentary is far more advanced than Hulsevi's, even though he almost fully adopted his English translation in the, of the Han Shu in his book. Of course, I'm not saying that Japanese or Chinese must be correct, but if one just keeps neglecting the sinological discussion in East Asia, it will be very risky. After, after all, the scholars inherit traditional knowledge of the imperial China, such as Wang Xianqian or Xu Song, and many other earlier Chinese scholars. Anyway, let's see what means Albert Hellman's useful work mentioned by Louis? It means Hellman's dissertation in 1910. Uh, 1910. So it is this book. Uh, the Arten, Zeiden, Straßen, Fischen, China, and Zihin, or uh, the sealed work on, between China and Syria. Actually, it cost me much time in Japan to find a good scanner for scanning his map, as well as uh, other German maps here. As there are different but all very used copy in Kyoto University and other universities, including the ones donated by Kuwabara Takeo from his father's collections. So here, this is the map of Hermann as an appendix or a additional map at the end of his uh, dissertation. And this is uh, the one provided by Marquardt in 1938. In fact, Wabala Takeo is a uh, So actually, uh, Kuwabara Takeo is a famous scholar in Japan. He translated Le Rouge et Noir and Le Contrat Social and many other French literature into Japanese. And he also inherited his father's. Yeah. He also inherited his father's research interest in China and in Inner Asia. So he led the publication of Kyoto University's research report on the Yungang Grottoes and other field work uh, area in China. And he also helped to establish his university's geographical and archaeological expedition to Afghanistan and Pakistan during his career as the director of Institute of Research in Humanities, Kyoto, uh, Kyoto University. Do you know him? No. Okay. <laughs> oh no, he he's not the one who really traveled there. He only went to Bhutan and other, but uh, he's very good in European languages, you know. Now let's return to Yu's commentary and Hellman's map. About, I just uh, show this slide again. So again, on this note, that the approximate distance between the seat of the king's government of Dayuan and that of Kangju 
roughly the distance from Fergana to the Turkestan north of the Sir Darya. So about this Turkestan north of Sir Darya, uh, it is not clear that in this phrase itself whether it means a small town or a large area. If we look Hillman's map here, it is just the name of the town. I try to enlarge this, right? This is Turkestan yes. here, right? Okay. And yeah, while if we look Makwa's map, it is indeed means also a town to the north of Sirdaria and south of the Karatau here, Karatau Mountains. Therefore, this commentary implies that the capital of Kangju in Zhang Qian's period is most likely around Turkestan. On the other hand, Shilatoli once expressed his concept of the capital city of Kangju, Bei Tiancheng, uh, in the Han Shu. Well, this name is actually not found in the Shi Ji, but only in the Han Shu book of the Han, so written a little bit later. So, she actually assumed that it was Bei Tiancheng, it was an ancient, ancient city situated in the area from Timkent here and to the area around Turkestan here because this area is good for water, grassland, and relatively free from the northern wind. And I have to say that Shilatoli never traveled into Central Asia. He just somehow make this conjecture. I must, my voice seems to be back, so I just want to comment shortly. This is an extraordinary intuition. Yes, because, intuition, uh, indeed. Because it's, it, it matches exactly Yes. The current opinion of archaeologists, especially Tobushkin, about uh, the probable location of the zone of Beitian. Yes. Actually, Turkestan is still a famous site, but it's famous mainly because of uh, its shrine to uh, Roger Ahmad Yassawi, erected by Tamerwey. So it's a major to, uh, touristic site. And it is the northern, well, I would say, the northern uh, site where there are clusters of Kankyu uh, graves. Uh, and also, there is a settlement, not very big, but there is a settlement which I intend to present in the last sessions. And also, Concentrating on the, the, including the Aris region is an excellent intuition. Uh, I might add another argument, which is actually mentioned by Yatsenko. Uh, it is stated, I think it is in the Hanshu, uh, that uh, the Beitian is close to a big lake. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, if you look, if you look at the map. <coughs> the American air map. You find the big lake uh, not far from uh, where near towards the lower Aris River. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Yatsenko says, uh, of, well, other lakes might have existed in the past. Simply, uh, the course of the Sierra and Aris is very meandering. So uh, there is, there are plenty of possibilities that other big lakes might have existed. Something I don't understand. Uh, you quote, uh, you quoted before. Yes. From Mutai Shan quoting Kuwabara. Uh, it's apparently a, a, a sentence in the Hanshu. Is that Gushan, capital, capital of Taiwan, is north of Beitian. Uh, Beitian is north. Huh? Beitian is Beitian northwest is to the okay. Guishan. It's, uh, it's not really, it's not completely true. Uh, well, uh, well, for us it's northwest. 
driver than north. Okay, okay, okay. In this sense, to the, uh, well, it, uh, it, it's accepted. Uh, then, but maybe at the end of this session, I uh, would like to make a short comment on the, the simultaneous apparition, uh, the simultaneous beginning of a real scientific history of subject, <coughs> both in the West yes. by Pilio, yes. who really is the founder of yes, the I think so. Ontology in the 1930s, in his articles, and by Shiratori, mm -hmm. who, is, uh, who, who, who is unquestionably the founder of Japanese sociology. At the same time, well, shortly afterwards, 1947, uh, I would like to mention the, the articles which set up the real beginning of Soviet sociology from archaeological, uh, from archaeological uh, materials. And uh, I must add that at that time, uh, the Soviets probably were not acquainted with Shiratori, and possibly were not acquainted with Pelioi. Possibly. But it's interesting to see that uh, sociology crystallized in the in the in, in, in the thirties and, and, and uh, in the thirties and forties. Uh, uh, it crystallized in the mind of Scora, uh, yes, and before it really exploded in mm -hmm. the fifties and sixties with excavation of Benjica. Okay. But I, I, I just I make a short intervention. Yes, of course. So, uh, yes, uh, we just uh, talk about that. Yes, in this phrase, it is not uh, so clear that whether here Turkestan means a region or a town or, or not. And at least as I far. Think it means a town. But yes, as I will show, <laughs> try to show. <laughs> as far as we can uh, see from on the uh, Hermann's map and Mark Fatwand, well, indeed, Turkestan just means uh, a town. And uh, the problem is that concerning the Tianchi, you just mentioned the same character as Beitian Cheng, because Beitian, literally, it can be perhaps translated as Lord Lian Tian. So if this Tian indeed means Tianchi, then usually sinologists would uh, interpret that Tianchi as Isikul, but Isikul is here. And here is what uh, Hermann put his country here, and then also his Dayuan here around Fergana. But I think we can go back to the problem of Tianchi for the next session, next Thursday. Now let's uh, just go through this one and if we look another German work and his map, uh, Frankes Beiträge auf chinesischen Quellen zur Kenntnis der Türkvölker und Skitten Zentralien, so um, research from Chinese sources on the knowledge about Turkic people and uh, sit, sit, yes, of Central Asia. So the map in his book in Franke, 1904, is based on Sven Harding's travel into Central Asia and Northwestern China around the turn of the 20th century. And, well, this copy also belongs to Kuabala's personal collection. Okay. Uh, Franke's map, based on uh, Sven Harding, uh, Turkestan is clearly drawn as a region. I already put here for you and which represent the European idea in many other maps in the 19th century. So it is outside the Qing Empire of China in Sven Heading's days, and which built the Xinjiang province between the Altaic Mountains and the Pamirs in around 1884, I think. So 
on this French map, uh, well, not I forgot to add it, but well, I will show it next time. There's another French map drawn in the 19th century that also expressed the concept of Turkestan as a region, as an example. Actually, it just means something between the Oxus and the Yarhat. Do, do you have any? Uh, the notion of Turkestan is floating, really floating. Yes, I think uh, so. Uh, as you say, in some context, it is a town to uh, In some context, it's a, it's a region where the all, all which can be seen is that, say, uh, is a country of the Turks, north of the country of the Iranian-speaking uh, Soviet. Uh, it, uh, we have an element now, but unfortunately it does not provide a uh, very uh, 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 geographical location. The f as far as I know, and I think Etienne will agree, the very first apparition of the term Turkestan in written sources is the Marie, it is the slave, the slave selling contract from Turfa. Dated 639, edited, uh, edited uh, by Yutaka uh, Yoshida. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is when uh, the, the, the a slave, a slave girl is sold on the market in Turfan. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the buyer is, is Chinese, mm -hmm. suppose a bank. The seller and witnesses, I think, are all subject. Eh? And the girl is said uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be from Turkestan, slave girl from Turkestan. And her name, if I remember, or rather nickname, is, I think, Turk. But I don't remember exactly. Opacha, Opacha, Opacha which means uh, then we had. Auntie or so. Well, she did not yes. know that. But it means, uh, uh, as we say now, as we say now in French for a little girl, we, we say petite mère. Mm -hmm. uh, it's auntie, it's uh, an affectionate term, term for, for a girl. Uh, well, she's from Turkestan. But? But nothing else is... Actually, I gave a note, already, although not yet published, but well. I think two years ago, Adam Denketo wrote me about how to uh, identify etymology of the, this girl's name, and I also answered as far as I can. But in the meantime, I also remind him, and per perhaps he had incorporated this note somewhere in, in his latest work. And I think this girl, she is known to be from the Chuyak, right? The Chuyak tribe? And yes, yes. I think Chuyak is just a Zhuye clan of the Shatua people. It is a uh, people around the northwest China, actually not far at all. I mean, wow. if um, it is here around okay. inside today's China, just between Xinjiang and uh, even Gansu, and and just uh, very active around Turfan. So it is not necessary to identify Turkestan in that country. A contract In that around. context, yes. Turkestan could be a covering name for a, the, a country of nomadic yes. Turks. Yes, actually. And it can stretch from the borders of China. Yes. To, uh, uh, it's just to differentiate from, yes. from, from Chinese, from yes. people in the Italian principalities, and from the Soviet. Yes. So my concern is what means, I mean, in Shilato these days, what means Turkestan? In, in, when he uh, studied abroad in Europe and learned about the concept of Turkestan and then used this of concept in his theory of ancient peoples. Otherwise, in medieval sources, what Etienne has Turkestan as a designation of territories south of Sirdaria down to the Andaria mm -hmm. uh, was due to the Russians. And it was simply a way to uh, give a name, a, a, a sort of a Cover name 
for the territories that had conquest, uh, taking, uh, taking uh, into account the fact that most people were Turkish speaking. But uh, I don't think in medieval sources we find Turkestan apply to the zone between uh, Amudarya and Sirdarya, mm -hmm. which is usually called Navarana, which means the country between the rivers. Uh, well, it's well, it's well, it's well it's uh, Bon, on a effectivement, ça rentrait dans, dans le contrat, ça vient de tout faire la notion de Turkestan. Donc c'est effectivement intéressant si vous pouvez le, le léguer aux châteaux qui sont juste au nord de Tourfrag, hein, juste au nord de, de, du bord de la chaîne. Ça c'est nous. Donc, donc euh, ça, ça c'est bien. Mais en fait, on a un autre texte qui est extrêmement intéressant, c'est le texte qui est édité par Pico et, et Nicolas, si vous souviens, Nicolas et Elena, c'est toujours si vous vous souvenez. Euh, dans lequel euh, une lettre sur Vienne euh, euh, envoyée à Tourfrag, euh, dans lequel, en fait, l'employé le, 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 du grand marchand sovien explique qu'il aurait pu envoyer les biens de ce grand marchand dans un certain nombre d'endroits, euh, mais je, et, il aurait pu aller, je ne suis pas allé en Somme, je ne suis pas allé au Turkestan, ni au Tibet. Donc on a le Turkestan, on a visiblement, il y a Sovian, compris comme je pense à la partie sédentaire et radiophone, euh, opposé au pays des Turcs et au Tibet, mais surtout, après, il dit aussi... Euh, euh, à propos de ces biens, la, la, la plupart de ces biens euh, sont sortis de mes mains, les uns à Rundan, c'est-à-dire en Chine, la capitale chinoise, euh, chez les Ouïghours, donc on est à fait 744, au moment où les Ouïghours contrôlent donc, la Mongolie, et au Turkestan. Donc la Mongolie n'est pas le Turkestan. C'est ça qui est intéressant. Donc à mon avis, le Turkestan, ça colle très bien ce que vous avez dit sur les chapeaux. Euh, le le, le Turkestan pour moi c'est le, le flanc nord de la Tienchal. Du Sémiretier, du Lucir d'Aria, si vous voulez, euh, de Turkestan, la ville de Turkestan actuelle, jusqu'au nord du. jusqu'à au nord de Ami, du, euh, voilà, de, au nord de Tourfan, etc. C'est vraiment voilà, la, la zone nomade, l'endroit où commence la zone nomade, le nord de la Tienchal. Mais donc à ce moment-là, oui. Parce qu'on a une Les Ouïghours ne sont pas encore. Voilà, ils sont en niveau pour en train de nord. Voilà, mais le, le centre de leur pays c'est le nord. Euh, et voilà, le pays des Turcs est encore désigné comme euh, opposé au pays des Ouïghours, euh, qui là ne peut être que la Mongolie. Mm, ok, actually, I just uh, continue to show more maps, and old and contemporary ones, so that I, I forgot to put this old French map. Anyway, so again, I just show the, this uh, area map that I took during my flight from Kyoto to, from Osaka to Paris this year. And actually, if we read Shilatoli's papers very closely, and it is almost the same as Yu Taishan's expression on the boundary of Kangju, namely it should be north of the Sir Daria, and just, well, this southern area, I'm not so sure, but at any rate, the eastern Eastmost border is around Tarats. And a, sen a very similar concept, but not uh, so totally identical, can be found on the map of the Western Han China from the Zhongguo Li Shi Di Tu Ji, namely the official historical maps of the ancient China published in Peking in 2018. So this is the map. And here we have a capital of uh, Western Han. And by enlarging it here, you see Kangju. So a little bit in true to the south of the Sir Darya, actually because uh, sinologists in China believe that in that period, Sogdiana was subjected to Kangju. So in this sense, Sogdiana is also included in this uh, general term. On the other hand, the, when the period uh, was uh, turned to the Eastern Han China, now the official map of the PRC China just distinguished Su Yi here, or Sogdiana, to the south of uh, Sirdaya from Kangju to the north of Sirdaria. So is that okay for you? And um, 
Well, of course, you can ask whether it is good or not to put Fergana or Dayuan into Han's own territory, but this is not my issue today. Just to show you how um, people today in China consider about the uh, territory of Kangju on the uh, westernmost area to the outside China. Actually, in a map that we already showed last year from Yoshida's uh, book, uh, edited by with, together with another Japanese scholars, only Sogdian art and Sogdian languages published in 2011, he provides a map of the Kushan dynasty. So, well, a, a little bit contemporary with the Eastern Han period and later, around the first century, two, three, or fourth, well, as depending on how do you define what is Kushan dynasty. So in that time, we already provide a very uh, simple English translation for the most important peoples to the north and west of China. So you see here is the Xiongnu, the most powerful nomad in the north of China, Han China, and also the Wusun to the north of the Tianshan Mountains here, and Dayuan or Dawan, the Fergana Valley, Kangju just to the south of the, uh, what is Aurasi, right? And between the Yarhat and Oxus. And the, remote, the most remote one is Yansai or Arzi. But if you look it closer, actually in this map, the boundary between Kangju and Yansai is not drawn at all. On the other hand, in this period, uh, Yoshida would distinguish Sogdiana here from Kangju. So Sogdiana in the Kushan period is to be enclosed within Kushan dynasty, while Kangju just uh, occupied a more northern uh, area between the two rivers, just to the Aral Sea, perhaps, and then also perhaps for broader, but actually he did not. I will explain. On this just but I wouldn't say wrong, but his information probably at that time was not completely up to date. Because now we have more very solid reasons to put the border between Sojana Kangju uh, along the vice river Hisa branch. Hisa branch. Uh, we have both numismatic reasons and archaeological reasons. Yeah, then Especially we can discuss that Rappers, next time. Yeah. Exploration of the zone and uh, uh, more precise numismatic studies. But this is a general tendency. This has been a general tendency since the beginning of the Kushan studies to put the Kushan border too far to the north. Uh, for many years after Tolstov, the Soviets have put the Kushan boundary up, up to Khorezm. And then there is a, a persisting, uh, a lingering tendency to draw to to include Samarkand uh, in the Kushan Empire. Uh, well, uh, after excavating 20 years at Samarkand, I am absolutely convinced that it was never part of the Kushan Empire. Maybe there were some roads, maybe some episodes. Okay. But it was not structurally a part of the Kushan Well, but, well yeah. So this is another point we can discuss. Maybe. Yes, of course. Here I just want to show that actually this map is not drawn by Yoshida, his own, I think. He's uh, from another earlier map by Odani. So I just choose this for you. Although I plan to uh, explain it later. It's not this one. OK, you see this one is here. You see this is Bactria. Uh, Bactra. And um, yes, actually, it is from Odani's book, almost identical. So namely, from Odani's book in 2010, and on the Great Yuezhi, and the first edition is 1999. So just to show you 
the model in Odani's uh, opinion. Actually, he's also from Kyoto as uh, Yoshida Sensei. So, in Odani's view, around the third century BCE, Yuezhi is uh, somehow roughly spread in the northwest of China and quite remotely. And then, somehow, after uh, several uh, attacks by the Shonu around the uh, second century BCE, it was split to the great Yuezhi and the smaller Yuezhi, and <coughs> in brief, <coughs> it seems that the main branch of the Yuezhi or the great Yuezhi just somehow moved, somehow I mean that the itinerary is not clear at all, but somehow moved westward just to today's Bactra or Tokharistan. So, and here I just uh, draw the boundary of Partia for you. So this pink, it means Partia, at last, uh, both in the same map, and this is the boundary of Bactra, a uh, Greek Bactra kingdom. <coughs> <coughs> and yes, <coughs> England, not this one. <laughs> So you see that this is the diagram that we, I just show for you. And he, I think next week I will discuss about pulley blank scheme, about uh, a model about how Zhang Qian moved from Da Yuan to Da Yue Zhi. But let's just uh, continue to show Odani's map. I think, sorry. Uh, Yes, this one. Okay. So here you see Krilet, uh, right? This is Kangju, and here this is also Kangju. So the boundary between Kangju and Great Yuezhi, and then the Kangju and Kushan dynasty is dynamic in Odanese views. And of course, it is to be again discussed with you in next uh, week, uh, together with more philological and archae archaeological data. But anyway, actually, Yoshida only used uh, the, this very famous map in Japan in his days when he is trying to compile many things about Sogdian. And in that book, he already discussed about Kurtobe inscription. You remember about the the term Sogdic from. Uh, from the Han Shu and uh, no, the, the, the identification of Sui as Sogdic, and also try to find the history relation of it with Kurtobe inscription, but he did not make any conclusion. I think maybe we have to find the uh, photographer because I think right now this recording is just disrupted. So there's what happens, uh, the PowerPoint is uh, or? I mean, the recording of uh, PowerPoint is disrupted. Maybe. The recording? Yes, because we just uh, jump out uh, the running of slide, then I think it will be disrupted. Okay. <laughs> so I just continue to explain your question a little bit more. Actually, it is possible to measure the actual length of one Li again by measuring the length of ancient city wall of uh, ancient capital like Chang'an or Luoyang. And indeed, archaeological uh, archaeologists produce some new data. But uh, I will leave this to, to the next sessions. And let's just accept that one Li just uh, is about uh, 0.4 kilometers or 400 meters. So I just continue to read the next phrase, actually only two characters, Xing Guo. Actually, it's just a nominal phrase, a term. And it is translated so variably by a different translator. For example, if you read Yu Taishan's uh, edition and commentary, it is translated as, it is the land of nomads. Yes. <laughs> But in Shiratoli's paper on his uh, identification of Sogdiana with Su Te in Chinese, 
he translate this entry and give it as country blah 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 is an itinerant country. I'm not sure what it means for in English, but he tried his best. Yes. And to his paper in the proceeding of the Kushan conference around the uh, 1960s, he just translated as it is nomadic state. So here state correspond to the second character guo, and this nomadic just corresponding to this first character xing, uh, literally moving or walking or so. And then in what sense, uh, I think this is wrong, what sense actually 1993, on his English translation of Shi Ji, he translated it as its people likewise are nomads. And this is the translation adopted by Harry Falk in his text, text selection for a Kushan history. And finally, Thierry, Francois Thierry gives a set Tan Royaume nomad. See, there are two options. Yes. And I'm not sure the Chinese characters are low to decide between. It can mean, uh, it can mean uh, it's a country of nomads. Yes. But it can mean also it is a country where the court is nomad. With a, with a moving, moving yes. And uh, I am not at all sure that issue can be decided uh, from the Chinese characters. Yes, I agree. And indeed, if we just uh, uh, placed aside about the moving or interchange of the capital in winter and, and summer or even more. Uh, actually, I gave a note during that Kushan conference in Berlin in 2013 and digest to a very uh, simple one in by Harry Falk himself in this book. So here I just read what is finally published in his book. So here to translate Xing Guo Ye, or I think here we are talking about uh, another version in Han Shu and letters. As a nation of nomads, and actually this is a possibility mentioned during Kushan conference in 2013. So to translate it as a nation of nomad, it's satisfying because in that time we have diff several uh, candidates and we debate much on it. However, whereas the translation of the first passage of Han Shu as the land of nomad is not so appropriated in my own opinion, because literally Xing Guo means moving country or moving union of tribes. And so I would rather translate the passage in the respective text as the great Yue Zhi was originally a moving people or a moving country just literally, and it changed its location follow its heart, and the way of life is the same as that of the Xiongnu, etc. However, if we look back to the Zhang Qian's report very seriously, actually only four countries were described as Xing Guo by Zhang Qian, namely these four ones with blue, highlight the Wusun in the north of Tianshan Mountains and the Da Yue Zhi just arrived at Bactria and also the very remote Yan Cai or perhaps Aorzi and the Kangju in our question. So what I would like to say is that I just rely on, uh, basically rely on a famous commentary of Shi Ji called Shi Ji Ji Jie compiled in the middle of the fifth century and in this commentary, it is said, it is explained that Xing Guo just means Bu Tu Zhuo. That means it is not stitched to or rooted into the soil. That's what it means. So it is something uh, against, contrary to the state that is rooted into the soil or stitched onto the soil. That is the difference. On the other hand, the Guo itself can refer to red, uh, either a country, to a region, to a state, as a union of tribe, of course, if it means nomadic states. For example, we know that the Wusun Guo, 
The Wusun is described in the Han Shu as the state of the Wusun, and in the Wei Shu, the Ye Da Guo is, uh, can be restored as the state of astalite, something like that. So Guo is not necessarily to translate it just as the land, a land of nomad, but rather state or even state of union or tribe. We don't know. It is to be further it interpreted and discussed. Okay. In the case of the, of the Yue Qi, for example, where it's clear, it's, it, is a, it is a nomadic ruling elite mm -hmm. which has settled into a country where some people are still, are still, are still sedentary. Archaeologically, this is a picture. Uh, we know now that uh, in the regions where Zhang Kien met the Yue Qi, he describes them. Uh, villages uh, or in fortified state settlements never cease to exist. Uh, so uh, clearly, perhaps sometimes it can be translated as a fully nomadic country, although we know now that uh, full nomads don't exist. Okay. Don't exist. Uh, uh, all uh, all nomads have a certain form of agriculture, and they have a certain, they, 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 all nomadic states rely on, on villages. And, okay. It can be, can be considered as such. And, uh, as far as uh, the head class is concerned, it's clearly that uh, the, 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 the members of the head class elite met by the Chinese clearly uh, have kept the nomadic way of life because they are described in their pen, they are described in their yurts, and they move from pasture to pasture, and uh, the king has several wives, each, each in, a, in, a particular, in a particular place, and they move from one to the other. This is the elite. At the same time, we know perfectly well that uh, they have to let, in the have to let, uh, State, uh, towns, villages, uh, sedentary agriculture, agriculture never stopped to exist. It's enough to look at the, mm -hmm. at the Rome archive to see the continuity of a certain way of life. So uh, I agree with you that uh, it's impossible to impose a unified translation. It depends upon an appreciation of the we have yes. to keep to uh, a broad, uncompromising, uh, a broad, uh, uncompromising uh, covering name. No yes, I generally I no agree. The state is a good choice because it can it can it can cover the it can cover the spectrum from. Uh, a nomad, uh, 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 really a completely nomadic people and country to uh, uh, a nomadic ruling, ruling elite. Yes. Well, what I can say only from Chinese sources is that, um, well, first of, all, it, first of all, it is a little bit strange that Shonu is not described by Zhang Qian as Xin Guo, as moving country. In this way, perhaps there is another possibility to translate Xin Guo as a, con a country or a state during its long distance movement. It's just only a possibility. However, is there, uh, 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 isn't there another explanation? Zhang Qian yes. did not have to qualify the Xiong Wu because they were very well known to the Chinese. So there Perhaps. Was, there, was, there was no reason to give a particular, to, 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 <coughs> to, 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 to deal with the way of life of the, of the Xiongnu because the Chinese had known them for centuries. And uh, what Zhang Qian, his, his aim is to provide information on countries which are lesser known 
or, or not known at all. Yes, I think it is a so possible uh, explanation. Oh. <laughs> I think it also depends on whether the order of Shonu ever ch change between different places or not. But for that, I dare not say because I'm not specialist of the Shonu, right? And also inside the great empire of Shonu, they also divide their, this empire to different parts and the uh, western part and eastern part were the slaves by different uh, smaller kings, uh, the wise king of the left and wise king of the right, etc. So if we really, we really want to compare the structure of this nomadic empire with others, it will become a very difficult and complicated problem. And anyway, it is also a little strange that in the Shiji there are four Xingguo, just on this diagram. But in the Han Shu, uh, I think there are only two attestations of Xingguo. So again, Da Yue Zhi is uh, clearly described as a Xingguo. And the other attestation is on the entry of uh, Zi He, I think. It is uh, described that the state of Zihe around uh, Kochan, but in a more mountainous area, their way of life is uh, close to the Xingguo of the Qiang and Di peoples. And these two barbarian peoples would mean some peoples even to the Qinghai, today's Qinghai in Tibet or the south of the Hexi corridors. So it Either the concept of Xingguo is different from Bangu, the author of uh, Han Shu and Zhang Qian's, or somehow they, have, they share the same common sense, but in the period when Han Shu is written, the other three states could be no more conceived as Xingguo. Perhaps it's just a possible explanation. And indeed, as uh, we just, uh, I just uh, referred to, actually this is an entry on the Great Yue Zhi, not on Kangji, uh, on Kangji, right? So in Han Shu, <coughs> he links these moving people in country back to the ways of life as that of Xiongnu. That means at least in the view of the author of the Han Shu, <coughs> or the Ban family we, we already explained that in this case, we can imply that Xiongnu is also a Xingguo, just like what you said. But <coughs> I think there's still space of different interpretation on this passage. So maybe we should open to more questions or comments. Uh, can, you, can you go back to Peyu and Shematori together? Yes. en français. Euh, je ferai probablement une... Oui, j'en reparlerai dans une séance suivante. Donc on voit très bien euh, que, que la notion de Sogdien euh, se précise à cette époque hein, avec les, les articles de Pellio euh, qui n'a pas tellement écrit... Euh, oui, Chavan... Euh, 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 bon, bien en... Euh, euh, Bien entendu, bien entendu, Chavannes parle, parle en grand détail euh, du, des pays sogdiens, des principautés sogdiennes, mais euh, on voit très bien en le lisant que euh, il a une perception pas très claire de, du type de civilisation que ça représente. En fait, il, euh, parce que dans, à certains moments, euh, oui, il, 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 semble, il semble les considérer en fait comme il, il parle d'intermédiaires nomades, voilà. De, euh, il est, il, en fait, il n'arrive pas véritablement à, à, à mettre de la substance derrière, euh, derrière les, les, les. Il reproduit les descriptions, mais euh, il, il est mal à l'aise pour euh, euh, désigner les, les, les tas de civilisations. Euh, on, euh, euh, 
Pélio est le premier qui, euh, comprend le problème, qui comprend la question, qui comprend qu'il y a eu des colonies sogdiennes. Voilà, son article sur la colonie sogdienne du Lobe Nord paru en, Étienne, 1930 et quelques, même à, très tôt. Hein ouais, c'est ça, c'est ça. C'est vraiment le premier qui ait compris, euh, qui ait compris ça. Euh, et puis avant même qu'on euh, ait eu par Reichelt la première, tra la première traduction euh, des anciennes lettres euh, euh, qui montrent l'activité d'une colonie soviétienne en Chine euh, et puis euh, donc sur euh, le, 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 la définition euh, euh, la définition de la, de, de, de la soviétienne proprement dite euh, positionné par rapport au Kankyu, c'est évidemment Shiratori qui a ouvert la voie. Alors ce que je voudrais dire, c'est que euh, tout ça, euh, va, euh, euh, aussi bien Chavan, Pelio et euh, Shiratori ne savent à peu près rien de ce qui se, de ce qui se trouve dans les couches archéologiques euh, de euh, la Sogdiane à, à cette époque, euh, voilà, correspondant à cette époque, puisque il euh, le, le, y a très peu de fouilles qui ne donnent pas des résultats, qui ne sont pas menées de manière euh, si, euh, vraiment scientifique. Et euh, bon, il y a du matériel, on voit qu'il y a du matériel sogdien dans les, qui, qui, dans les musées, des, on, connaît, on, on commence à connaître les terres cuites, etc. Mais ça ne. Euh, ça, ça ne donne qu'une perception extrêmement partielle. Mais les choses ont bougé brusquement côté soviétique, exactement, euh, euh, disons, dans les années, euh, fin des années 30, enfin, dans les années encadrant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Euh, juste avant, il y a la première révélation de euh, la vie euh, aristocratique et palatiale sogdienne par les découvertes de Vararsha. Ça, ça a commencé avant, c'est donc dans l'oasis de Bukhara, ça a précédé tout ce qu'on a trouvé à Samarkand et à Penjikent. Hein c'est donc, euh, donc euh, Shishkin euh, qui a commencé à publier des articles euh, sur euh, la découverte du palais de Valarcha, qui était donc, qui est donc, donc le palais hors les murs des, euh, des souverains de Bukhara, euh, avec euh, la première révélation de l'art de la peinture murale. Alors, évidemment, les, 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 la, belle public, la, la grande publication complète, bien, euh, enfin, bien illustrée avec les moyens de l'époque, ne va paraître, je crois, que en 1962. Mais euh, voilà, on, on commence à ce moment-là à savoir. À... C'est la première révélation. Euh, L'un au moins des panneaux de Valarcha sera à l'exposition au Louvre en novembre, avec une reconstitution du salon rouge euh, où elle se trouve. Et puis euh, après, là, on a quelque chose de moins spectaculaire mais d'extrêmement solide, juste après la guerre. C'est un article, un gros article absolument fondateur euh, de Terenochkin qui euh, a euh, en fait repris les, pour la première fois sur des bases scientifiques euh, les fouilles de Samarcande. Alors les fouilles de Samarcande, elles avaient commencé depuis, euh, depuis pratiquement la conquête russe, enfin les premières fouilles vers 1880, mais ce sont vraiment des dégagements euh, pas stratigraphiques. Il euh, bon, euh, y a du matériel qui sortait, qui s'entassait dans le musée de Saint-Marcande. On ne savait pas bien dater. Euh, on, a surtout trouvé, euh, on a surtout trouvé la mosquée, euh, euh, puis, puis des choses d'époque islamique. Euh, et il euh, y avait... Euh, C'était l'archéologue Vietkin. Il avait laissé partout des, des, des tranchées. Voilà, parce que il, euh, il fouillait le long des murs, il longeait les murs. Il, évidemment, à l'époque, il n'y avait aucune notion de stratigraphie. Et en 1947, euh, un archéologue génial qui s'appelait Terenochkin, 
qui avait été formé à la méthode de fouilles scientifiques sur les fouilles de mer Noire. Les, les, fouilles, les, premières, les, fouilles, les premières fouilles soviétiques vraiment scientifiques, c'était au bord de la mer Noire, euh, et c'était l'héritage déjà euh, d'une belle école d'archéologie à l'époque des Tsars. Et Terenochkin, arrivé à Samarkand, a, compris, a, a nettoyé les, les bords des trous et des tranchées qu'avait fait euh, Viatkin. Et il a établi une séquence stratigraphique Bon, avec des couches mécaniques, enfin, c'est pas vraiment la stratigraphie comme on la comprend nous maintenant, mais c'était déjà bien pour l'époque. Euh, et il a ordonné la céramique euh, dans des phases chronologiques. Et je dois dire que euh, nous, les archéologues de Samarcande, nous vivons encore là-dessus. Hein. Euh, il a compris, Terenochkin avait compris que Samarcande apparaissait à l'époque achéménide. Et euh, il a, je crois, il a divisé, c'est à lui qu'on doit les dénominations que nous employons toujours, Afrasiab 1, Afrasiab 2, Afrasiab 3, je crois qu'il a divisé en six périodes entre la fondation et la conquête islamique. Et actuellement, euh, dans, le, euh, dans la, la publication des céramiques que nous préparons, par rapport à Terenochkin, je dirais, euh, oui, euh, nous avons euh, amélioré, mais vraiment à la marge. Alors, je crois qu'on a introduit euh, une ou deux divisions de plus, et puis enfin, on, a, on a changé quelques dates, on a introduit quelques subdivisions de plus, mais c'est vraiment de la nuance. Et deuxième contribution extrêmement importante de Terenochkin que je voudrais mettre en rapport avec... Euh, le, euh, les, le, le travail de Shiratori. Uh, Chao Zhong, can you show again Shiratori's drawing of the limits of Kanku? Okay. So this, uh, that is, do the, you want this one? Or no, no, the, 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 the line okay. he drew in blue. Yes, so where is it here? So actually, This is what I tried ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. to trace. Yeah, this is what you drew. Yes, from, from well, ex extrapolating from Terenoshkin's, yes. uh, from uh, Shiratori's. No, uh, from uh, Shiratori's various works, okay. because here you find uh, one passage and other you find one passage. Actually, in one passage of, uh, no, not only, but several times in a paper, he said that, well, Country is just uh, recited on today's uh, Kirkis death. So it cost me a lot of time to find what is Kirkis death in, in the 19th century to early 20th century on a map. And actually, I can show you later. L'article de Terenochkin, yes. je ne suis pas sûr. Euh, je l'ai paru en, en 1947 dans une revue assez locale. Euh, je ne suis pas sûr d'avoir le d'avoir la photocopie chez moi, mais ça peut se trouver. C'est un gros article de 100 pages, ça s'appelle « Sog des Tchatch ». Et ce qui est remarquable, c'est que, donc, il est le premier à publier une séquence, non seulement de la céramique, mais de tout ce qu'on a trouvé en culture matérielle euh, sur le site de Samarkand. Donc, c'est la première fois qu'on voit se dessiner euh, archéologiquement la civilisation sogdienne en sogdiane et par ailleurs il, il fait une comparaison systématique avec les fouilles de la région de Tashkent alors je ne sais pas c'est un pur archéologue donc je ne sais pas euh, s'il s'intéresse beaucoup à la question du Kankyu euh, il n'avait certainement pas accès aux travaux de Shiratori euh, sans doute pas non plus à ceux de Pelio mais euh, Là, je cite de, de mémoire, hein. il montre dans son article que la culture du tchatch, c'est-à-dire Tashken, hein, euh, est à la fois apparentée, proche de celle de la Sogdiane, mais qu'elle elle a des caractères également différents. 
Et donc, en fait, ce qu'il a compris, c'est qu'il y a la Sogdiane et puis il y a les limites, disons, les limites sud du Kankyu. Voilà. Et ça, c'est en 1947. Et c'est le moment où Shiratori avait lui aussi compris qu'il euh, existe en fait, euh, il existe en fait euh, euh, deux euh, entités politiques euh, qui sont en rapport, euh, bon, hein, mais avec une certaine forme parfois de contrôle du Kankyu sur la Sogdiane, mais qu'en fait c'est différent et les Chinois le savaient. Donc euh, voilà, pour l'historiographie, euh, c'est vraiment, euh, c'est à ce moment-là qu'on a posé à chez nous, en Occident, au Japon euh, et euh, en, Russie, en, en, en URSS, les bases sur lesquelles nous vivons encore. Et alors, grâce à ces bases, tout ça évidemment a complètement euh, s'est épanoui quand à partir des années 50 et 60, on a eu les premières publications de la fouille de Penji Kent, ici, euh, qui, euh, pour la civilisation euh, d'époque soviétique pré-islamique, euh, fournissait euh, des, des, des données évidemment beaucoup plus riches et beaucoup plus précises que Samarkand, puisque euh, Penji Kent, après la conquête islamique, n'a duré que quelques décennies, alors qu'à Samarkand, on a, euh, on a euh, euh, six siècles accumulés euh, sur euh, les couches somniennes. Donc voilà ce que je voulais dire pour l'importance, la, la très grande importance de ces années-là, euh, qui ont, euh, disons, euh, fourni les bases intellectuelles de... Euh, euh, de la compréhension du matériel archéologique et artistique qui allait ensuite devenir disponible. Ok. Uh, just a final note that uh, if we use this map by Frankes, then the Kyrgyzstan step in Shiratori's concept could be even far north to the Turkish Tanami as a region. And also somehow uh, intrude a little bit southward, but actually quite a wild area in Shiratori's concept. So ah. the main center could be just to the south of Karatau Mountains, but in his eyes, the country is sorry, spread in a far more wide area. So which, we can discuss about Which is not untrue if we consider the uh, The, 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 the link with Yang, Yang Tsai. Uh, the good thing, I think, in Shiratori, Shiratori takes, has already understood that the Chinese had heard of Choresm in 110 BC, mm -hmm. and he does not include Choresm in Kankyu, which unfortunately Tolstov did with a strong influence. Uh, over many years uh, among uh, Soviet scholarship. Okay. So, I think it's time now. Huh? It's time. It's time. Okay. Merci. Donc, nous continuerons.